All right, we're looking at uh, GCO C9. This particular cluster deals with proof and all things about angles uh, and relationships with angles. I want to start first with talking about just a couple of pairs of angles. Um, we want to look at adjacent angles, vertical angles, supplement angles, linear pairs, and complements. So let me just kind of quickly uh, go through these definitions and then we'll look at the relationships involved. In the case of an adjacent set of angles, let's draw a relationship here. There's a, B, C, and D. Now, adjacent angles are speaking about two angles, or sometimes more, but adjacent means side by side, two angles that uh, share a vertex, share a ray, and no interior points. So a nice example of angles that are adjacent would be A, B, C, the angle in here, and C, B, D. A, B, C, this angle, and C, B, D, this angle. They both share the vertex B, they both have ray B, C, and because they are on opposite sides of that uh, ray, then they have no interior points. These are known as adjacent angles by definition. A common mistake here with this one is for students to list two angles like these two. These two angles, A, B, C, and A, B, D, do share vertex B, you can see that, do share ray BA, there's BA and BA, but they have common interior points. ABC is in the interior of ABD. These are not adjacent. Second uh, definition, vertical angles. Vertical angles are formed when two lines intersect. There are a number of angles formed when two lines intersect. The ones that are vertical, or sometimes I refer to them as opposite, are the ones that are non-adjacent, so not side by side, and that are non-adjacent angles that are formed by the intersection of two lines. So that can only be two and four, one and three they are vertical angles. Now in a minute we'll actually prove something about vertical angles, but for now let's define them. Next, supplementary angles are angles that sum to 180 degrees. So um, it might look like uh, this angle here of 30 and this angle here of 150. These together are called supplements. It might be an angle of 90 and another angle of 90. These two are called supplements. Another environment where that takes place is here. We might have 140 and 40. These are also supplements. Supplements or supplementary angles are just those that add up to 180 degrees. A specific subset of the supplements is the linear pair group. If you are a linear pair, you are adjacent angles that are supplements and form a line. This is a nice example of a linear pair. Adjacent angles, supplements forming the line, a lines pair, a linear pair. So this is a uh, a special type of supplement angle and it's known as a linear pair. This is like if you want to think about it this is if this is the boundary of all supplement angles okay this is a little Venn diagramming inside of that is our linear pair. This group is a special type of the general supplements. 
Finally, complement angles or complementary angles. These are angles that sum to 90. That could be uh, a, four, a 40 degree angle and uh, a 50 degree angle. These are complements. Uh, you could have a right angle that's given and then shown, say this is 20 and 70. These are also complements. Students often struggle with complement and supplement. Here's my tip. C comes first. S comes later. In the alphabet, CS in order 90, 180. Now we're going to begin a journey of proof. Proof is always a difficult thing in geometry and we're going to try and use the the foundation that we've built for ourselves to begin to prove new facts of, of relationships that we need to use in the future. So uh, let's take a look at that idea. A student quite easily can look at two lines that intersect and tell me that they think that angle, let's say BEA, this angle here, angle 1, might be congruent to CED, angle 2. Angle 1 and angle 2 are vertical angles and we want to maybe make a conjecture that we think angle BEA is congruent to angle DEC. This is what we are going to conjecture that vertical angles, non-adjacent angles formed by intersecting lines are actually congruent to each other. A conjecture, that's a guess or a hypothesis. And what we're going to try and do is use mathematical theorems and definitions and properties and characteristics and relationships that we already know that are facts and truths. We're going to use those to establish a new truth. Now, what I want you to understand is that we have been building a foundation of transformations all the way up. And so I want us to use transformations here. So... I want you to understand that, let's try this idea, that a rotation of 180 degrees might be the translation that actually does the trick for us. So let's do that. Let's do a rotation of 180 degrees um, about point E. So I'm beginning my proof by describing the logical steps I'm going to take. I am going to perform a rotation of 180 degrees about point E. And I know some things about a rotation because of its definition and things that we've already established. A rotation of 180 about point E maps B onto ray E D, known as B prime. In other words, by definition, earlier on and already, we talked about when you rotate 180 degrees, the characteristics of that is that it would be the same distance from the center, but more importantly, it will land on the opposite ray. So if I rotate B, it will land somewhere over on this side, equidistant away, right on ray E D. I know that by definition. It would also map uh, A onto its opposite ray, EC, known as A prime. So A prime would land on the opposite ray. I'm just picking a spot where approximately it would be, but we know it would go across there. Finally, I'm going to do one more point because I need to move an angle, and an angle needs three points. It also maps E onto E because we know that the center of rotation goes nowhere new. Now we're ready. Now listen carefully. So what we've done is we've done an isometric rotation of 180 degrees. We know by definition that it has to land on the opposite rays, which it did perfectly. Now let's use the logic. 
So angle BEA, our original angle, is congruent to its image B prime, E prime, and A prime. Now why is the original and an image equal or congruent to each other? I'll tell you why. Because you just did an isometric transformation. Because rotations are isometric. And we know by definition earlier that an isometric rotation preserves the angle size, uh, copies angles, all of those things we need. Here's the second thing we know. Angle B prime, E prime, A prime, this guy right here, is congruent to the original D, E, C. Now why would that be? Well look, we landed it on that ray, we landed E on itself, and we landed A on that ray. Uh, they have to be congruent because they share the same vertex and rays. In other words, we copied it directly onto the other item. We're almost done. The final step is a nice piece of logic. BEA is congruent to B prime, E prime, A prime. Notice my next line states that B prime, E prime, A prime is congruent to DEC. The final step is what we call the transitive property. BEA is congruent to DEC because of the transitive property of equality. Now, I'm going to just stop here for a second. This is a beautiful proof based off of a transformational approach. It follows logically uh, the steps of, of, of a procedure. Every time we made a statement, we backed it with a reason. And we're using definitions of rotations being isometric. We're using the idea that uh, we're mapping onto something. And we're using the transitive property. Let me just quickly speak to the transitive property here. Just to give you uh, a quick side teaching about it. The transitive property actually it basically uses this logic. If something equals something, A equals B, and you find out that B equals C, you can conclude then A must equal C by the transitive property. All right? I'm actually going to prove the vertical angle theorem in what we would call the classic way as well. Um, this is an algebraic approach, nothing wrong with this, but the previous one really more emphasized what you and I have been learning over this time. So I'm kind of more interested in it, but this is certainly the classic proof and also one that is in every textbook. So I want to kind of quickly do it for you. You could say that angle 1 and angle 2 equaled 180 degrees, and I'm going to be quick on this one. The reason I know that is because they're a linear pair. See the lines pair? Supplement angles that are adjacent. It would also be true that 2 and 3 equal 180 degrees they, because they are also a lines pair or a linear pair, and therefore they're supplements. These two equations happen to be exactly equal to the same thing. So using substitution, I can plug this into that spot. So I can say angle 1 and angle 2 equals angle 2 and angle 3. That's a substitution process. The final step of this proof is something you can easily see. I could subtract the same thing from both sides. That's the addition subtraction property of equality, meaning I can subtract or add the same thing to either side of an equation and I get the measure of angle 1 is equal to the measure of angle 3, vertical angles 
are equal. Or one more step would say angle 1 is therefore congruent to angle 3 because of the definition of congruence, which means if the items are equal, then they are congruent. A very nice algebraic based proof. Linear pair relationship, linear pair, substitution, addition, subtraction, and bit de definition of congruence. Some good stuff here, some very beginnings of proof, a lot more coming.